that first. All right, tonight uh, we're going to be talking about uh, familiar spirits, generational curses. We're going to be talking about mediums, psychics, wizards, things like that that the Bible talks about. Um, if we don't finish up tonight, we're going to continue it on next week because I want to make sure we cover um, the story about King Saul when he went to the Witch of Endor uh, seeking wisdom. And I, I, the reason why I pulled it out is because it was brought up to me about, well, if we're not supposed to be seeking the counsel of wizards or psychics or mediums, you know, how is it that King Saul himself? And I thought, you know what, that's going to be a very good, that'll be a good example, a good illustration, one that we can talk about tonight. Maybe some of you have read it and kind of wondered about it. So uh, we want to make sure uh, we get that covered and then hopefully we can get into some of the recognizing the curses and so forth. All right. First Samuel 28, that's what we're going to start out with. Uh, I know it's quite a few verses, but bear with me. The Lord is going to definitely give us some revelation about what happened when King Saul went out to seek the occultic, uh, which is an abomination, and the Lord time and time again said in His Word that it was an abomination. But we're going to start out 1 Samuel chapter 28. It says, Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, Surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spirits, spiritists, which is another word for familiar spirits, out of the land. Now it's really important. Saul put them out of the land. He made a decree. They were to not be on the land that God had given them. That's very important because it's going to, you know, fall into place here as we go along. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, neither by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. And what Urim is, is Urim is when they would kind of cast lots, seeking God's answer. Number seven, then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Now remember, Saul had already cast them out thinking, I would assume, this is my commentary, that he was trying to appease the Lord because he had displeased him. He had disobeyed him time and time again. So when King Saul made them all leave out of the land, you know, that was a decree and they were, they, they left. But then what does he do? He doesn't wait to get an answer. He didn't hear from the Lord, so he took matter in his own hands. And how many times have you and I in our life, spiritual walk with the Lord, have asked the Lord of something and He didn't answer us right away. We get impatient and next thing we know, we start listening to the voice of the enemy. We try to get ahead. We get impatient. Look what happened with Sarah. She got impatient when God had already given a word. Alright, where were we here? Okay, verse 8. So Saul disguised himself, put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. What did Saul do? He disguised himself and put on other clothes. He had royal robes that he wore as the king of Israel, but he took them off, put on other clothes, and disguised himself. Are you hear what I'm saying? How many times have we 
done that? How many times have we taken off the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness? How many times have we taken it off and we've tried to go do things on our own? You hear me? Because I've been there. Okay? He did the same thing. All right. Okay, verse 9. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cast off the mediums and the spiritists, or familiar spirits, depending on your version, from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And, then, and Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. And God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you that you may reveal to me what I shall do. Then Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, now execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day and all night. And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice, and I have put my life in my, in my hands and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now, therefore, please, heed also to the voice of your maidservant, and let me set a piece of bread before you, and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. So his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house, and she hastened to kill it. She took flour, kneaded it, baked unleavened bread from it. What does that tell you? He was there a long time, wasn't he? <laughs> a long time. So she brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate, and then they rose and went away that night. All right. I want to cover some scriptures here real quickly, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Okay, Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14. I think that's on your list. I want to cover these first because I want to set the stage where the Lord had already told them, and I mean them, the children of Israel, that it was an abomination to seek after the occult, the dark, uh, the demonic realm. It was, an, it was an abomination. And so King Saul was very well aware of this. And in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14, it states, when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or one 
one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dis dispossess, listen to soothsayers, soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Now, he lays it out very clear. He said, I've given you this land, but I have not given you this land for you to do what those people that lived in that land did. And that was, in this case, to seek the occult. Is that happening, though, today? Very much so. But Satan has to be a little bit more subtle. He's got to be a little bit more subtle. Yes, there's a lot of people that call the psychic line. Yes, there's a lot of people that go to these psychics, the palm readers, the tarot card readers, and things like that, seeking their what they think is truth or a word from the Lord, but it's the word from the, what, demonic realm. But how else is the enemy deceiving us in today's time with what we just read? Anybody know? That's one, yes, because that's that's really in a sense like they were giving their sons and daughters and into the fire, in other words, to be killed. But also, isn't it things like with Harry Potter, Twilight series? Okay, don't shout me down if I'm pretty if I'm bridging it here. Oh, Pokemon, let's get real. Anything that is, is showing demonic power where they are demonstrating demonic power and forces. You have got to take a step back from it. That's how huh? he made an internet outlet. How many of you have flipped channels recently and what do you see? The Walking Dead, this and that, this and that, that is demonstrating the demonic realm, the darkness, the powers and the principalities. I bet if we were to put that side by side on how many of shows now are are giving a glory to the demonic realm versus how many channels are out there giving glory to God. Okay, so the Lord already said back in Deuteronomy to the children of Israel, do not do these things. Okay, all right, the next one, Deuteronomy 5, 8 through 10. It's another declaration of the word of God. And the Lord was speaking to them. And it says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. Now, I'm going to stop right there because you're thinking, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. Okay, you may not like this, but I'm going to tell you, I don't do statues of angels. Now, I'm not telling you you're, you're sinning because you have angels. I have a little thing that's in my house. What I'm saying is there's people that have statues of angels, and they do it. Why? Because they think it's protecting their home. That's what I'm talking about, where it's more than just having a cute little angel. I'm not talking about like if you have a little angel at Christmas time on your mantle. I'm talking about where people actually have angels in their houses because they feel like it's protection. That's really what I'm talking about. All right. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Which generation? For your children's sake. For your grandchildren's sake. I want to be a part of the one that says, to those who love me and keep my commandments, I'm going to show mercy to a thousand generations. But to those 
He said, who hates me? I'm going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't hate God. But you can take a lot of things from that. If we're disobedient, if we're rebelling against God, isn't that the same? Right? Okay. Can I say something here? Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Send the other scripture you were reading from 1 Samuel. Oh, okay. I definitely clearly saw why that is such an abomination to God to deal in sorcery, witchcraft, and all that. Because you're making choices to seek power, supernatural power, and it's not of God. And right here in Deuteronomy 5, it says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's jealous because you're seeking power somewhere else besides him where he has all the power to give you that you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Alright, these next two right here, Leviticus 19, Leviticus 20. Okay. Those two right there, what again, what does the Lord say? Leviticus 19, 31. Do not turn to mediums or spiritualists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Very, very plain, very direct. Verse 20, I mean chapter 20, verse 6. As for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritualists to play the harlot after them, I will also set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. And that's exactly what happened with King Saul. Um, listen to this. Well, I tell you what, let me back to you. Let's talk about King Saul for a minute. He put the occultic out of the land. So no one was to have anything to do with them. And this came from the king on down. But King Saul himself, here he was, you know, battle's about to come. The Lord had already turned his back on him because of his disobedience, because of his rebellion. He wasn't hearing from the Lord. So he seeks the principalities and powers. He takes back what he had declared that there would be no occultism in his land, and yet he himself ran to it. Okay? What's the point on that? And when I talk, when I'm saying to you, I'm also talking about myself because I've been there and done that. How many of us have done that? We've come to the Lord. Maybe we backslid. Guilty. So, I'm in a situation, I'm desperate, and I'm not hearing from the Lord. Why? Because I'm not walking with Him. I'm not obeying Him. I'm not living my life right, and yet all of a sudden now, there's this disaster going on in my life, and I'm all of a sudden now crying out to the Lord. He's not answering me. So guess what I did? I went deeper into the world to get my answers, to get what I needed, because I wasn't getting it from God. And well, whose fault is that? It's not God's, right? It's mine. Okay? This happened in my life. But Saul, then, like I said earlier, what does he do? He strips himself of the royalty, <coughs> sets it aside, and then put on the worldly. Okay? I did that because I had the garment of salvation and the robe of righteousness. And when I turned my back on God, I took it off. And here I then had the, the garment of the world on me. And so I was looking for the world to help me and give me answers when the world is not going to give me what I need. And especially because of the fact that I was living in sin. King Saul was 
rebellious and disobedient to God Almighty. God turned his back on him. He still let him be king. Why? Because he was anointed to be king. But he didn't have the anointing of the Spirit upon him like he did before. Actually, there was a tormenting spirit that tormented Saul. How many of us realize that when we walked away from God, we felt like this tormenting spirit was gnawing at us and gnawing? If I've been there, I've been there. Okay, I'll just admit it. Okay, I've been there. Saul then says, find me. Find me this medium. Find me this one with a familiar spirit. We talked about familiar spirits last week. And what are they? They are spirits that know everything about you and your family. They come from generation to generation. And they're all occulted. Like the example I gave last week. When someone goes to a psychic and they want a word from Uncle Joe. And the psychic is speaking as if it's Uncle Joe's voice. And she's telling him about stuff that's in the past and the childhood or this or that. And, and the person is just like, oh my gosh, I'm young and Joe would know that. No, that familiar spirit in that is telling that psychic spirits what you want to hear. Those are familiar spirits where they're familiar with you. They work together hand in hand. All right, so now Saul is there. He's asking her, I want you to conjure up the spirit of Samuel. He didn't tell her it was Samuel the prophet. He just said Samuel. Now, here's the big debate. A lot of people say, how could a witch or a medium conjure up a prophet of the Lord? How could she do that? I'm here to tell you she can't. She couldn't. It was only by God allowing that to happen. Because during that time, that was before the cross, you know that was the time where it talks about paradise and there was that gulf. Remember when Lazarus went down into the gulf and, and he saw Abraham's bosom and he was up there and then there was, you know, the, the rich man down here. At the time before the cross, there was that gulf that separated those that were in Abraham's bosom and those that were here in what we would just call Hades or Sheol. Okay, so this is kind of, Samuel was in this place, and so this witch could not have conjured up and called forth a prophet of the Lord who was in what we would call Abraham's bosom at the time. But because of the spirits in her, their spirit beings, they're able to see in like the spirit realm. Obviously, that is how she knew when Samuel came up, that it was Samuel the prophet. Why? Because she said, what did he have on him? He had on a mantle, which designated he was a, not only had been a prophet of the Lord, but he was an anointed man. And she recognized it, what? Immediately. Why am I saying that? To say this, for every one of you, when the word of God says that you shall cast out demons and that and when you do that in the name of the Lord, they recognize not only the spirit of God in you, but they see your spirit is connected to the spirit of the living God. And they're going to back up because they see the spirit of God in you. They recognize it. That's why. When the Lord says, you have the power and the authority to cast out demons, call them out, command them to get out, command them to lose their hold, they have to because they have to obey the name of Jesus. They have to obey the blood of Jesus. They have to obey the written word of God. That's all there is to it. And they do. Here's the thing. So many in the body of Christ are not aware of the power of God within them. When the scripture says the demons tremble at the mention of the name of Jesus, my goodness, they call his name out every time. Declare the name of Jesus. His blood, his blood on the cross when it 
was shed was more for just sin. It was for sickness and disease and curses and everything that you can imagine that was that was in the world that was against us. The blood covered it all. Transgressions, iniquity, you name it, the blood covered it all. And I am here to tell you, because y'all know Pastor Keith and I, and a few in this room are in the deliverance ministry, and I can tell you for a fact, that when we talk about the blood of Jesus and mention the blood of Jesus, the demonic spirits do not like it. I had one one time, he's like, stop. You know, the person was going, stop, stop, stop. And I just kept going, oh, the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. All oh, the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins. All oh, the blood of Jesus that brought victory on the cross. And they're like, stop. And they soon you know they were gone. They lifted off of that person. I am here to tell you the blood of Jesus is powerful. But you know what? Satan has talked the church out of even talking about it in the churches anymore. That's right. No, I don't talk about the blood of Jesus. That makes people uncomfortable. He knows the power of the blood more than the Christians do. And that's, we got to change that. He knows the power of it. He knows the power of the name of Jesus. And he knows how powerful the word of God is. The word of God cuts into pieces. The demonic realm cuts into pieces. Okay. All right. All right. Let's go. So, why then did Samuel, because, the, because what did Samuel tell him? Remember? He said, guess what? You and your sons are going to be with me. In other words, you have just, I'm just declaring your death sentence. Samuel told King Saul, you're going to die. How could Samuel even make that statement? Because the word of God said, anyone who seeks a medium or a spiritist or a sorcerer or a psychic or a all soothsayer, all that. The Old Testament says, you're going to die. Now, thank God for the cross, right? Yes. <laughs> but you know what now, though? If we see the demonic and the occultic, they could kill our bodies, but they could try to kill us and destroy us spiritually. That's what they really want. But the blood of Jesus and the cross of Jesus power and the grace of Jesus covers us. Amen? So then, how could that have happened to Saul? 1 Chronicles 10, 13, 14 says, So Saul died. How and why? For his trespass, which he committed against the Lord. Because of the word of the Lord, which he did not keep, and also because he asked counsel of a medium, making inquiry of it, and did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, he killed him and turned the kingdom to David, the son of Jesse. Now, here's a question. If there's a person who's not a Christian, who's not a believer in Jesus, and they go out and seek a medium, do you think that pertains to them? Yes. You think that pertains to them? Yep, it does. Why? Because they are not covered by the blood of Jesus. But isn't it, isn't it true that in your heart, whether you're a Christian or not, you know there is a God? I can't answer that. I don't know. I mean, I, I believe that God imparts into every human being a desire to worship someone, something. And, and those that choose to worship God are going to do that. But, and that's why so many of the people in the world worship something else, whether it's money or celebrities or fame or rock stars or whatever. They want to worship something. And I believe God instills that in every human being.
do want to worship someone. But I, my, and if you're asking me, I'm telling you, I don't think every person might necessarily have that desire towards God. A God, maybe, but not necessarily towards the God. And I don't know if I'm answering this question, but I, 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 I think that's why the free will and, and all that. But I do think God pulls at every person to to desire to worship and fellowship. If that makes sense. Right. 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 And that's where you trust God's mercy, that God's going to wow. send the labors, you know. Because God has that, you know. Sure. Because what is my word? No. Because God's a God of mercy. I don't mean to say, you know, predict me going to heaven now. I just know that through their course of life, God somehow will be. Right. Because I just, you know, just the regular way and stuff. Right. And what she was talking about was maybe like a tribe or something in Africa who hasn't heard about that. Here's the thing that I hold on to. What's the scripture said that the Lord's not going to come until what? Everyone has heard the word. And I believe in, you know, they have done translations in so many languages now. They've even done them into these, um, these jungles in, in the Amazon. They've translated, you know, languages into the people in the rainforest or whatever. But the scripture says that until everyone has heard. So, you know, and that's a debatable thing there that we could talk about, but I don't think it's okay. I'm going to move on here. All right. So, Saul, here's the understanding I want to make sure everybody had. Saul died, and actually the sons died in the battle. And the thing about it is what the scripture said, he died for his trespass, which he committed against the Lord. Because he didn't keep the word of the Lord and because he asked counsel of obedience and making inquiry of it. Okay? What is that saying for you and I? If we are to even take that and say, okay, Lord, how can I apply that to my life today? Well, I would definitely want to make sure I stay committed to the Lord. I want to make sure that I keep the word of the Lord and I want to make sure I do not involve myself in anything occultic. I mean, I think we have a good understanding of that. But he was killed because of what the Word of God said when he did. Okay? All right. I want to move over quickly because I want to go into the handouts that you have there. And if anybody has, you know, any questions at all later on, we can talk about the thing with Sam I saw. Oh, real quickly. Uh, I looked up. Daryl, help me here. But I looked up medium and spiritist, what the Hebrew word was. And the Hebrew word for a medium or a spiritist or spiritualist is, and it's pronounced all, it's O-W-B, that's the Hebrew word for it. So I was like, Lord, help me here. And so it took me to these three letters that make up, one of them being bet, which house, body, what's within, what's inside, Vav, connect, join, a leaf, olive. We all know when we think about that, we automatically think about the eternal God, God Almighty, because He's the what? The Alpha and the Omega and the Elite. All right, but it also can mean what is first, leader, and strength. Okay, and also eternal, spirit, spirit man, spirit God, a leaf. So I said, okay, Lord, help me to understand. With, it, with the Hebrew of this word, what are you basically saying and why this word? And basically what I came up with is that if we allow something to get inside our house and our body, we are going to be connected and joined to whoever, whatever that leader is, whatever the strength is that we are allowing into our life. Does that make sense? What's first in our life? What's first in our life? What are we allowing to join ourselves to our body, to our house, within what's inside? So it's amazing that the Hebrew word for this is talking about are you connecting yourself spirit to spirit? Because the word says that what? God is a spirit. 
occultic, demonic realms, what? Spirits. But what are we aligning ourselves to when we get involved with medium and spiritism or, you know, psychics? We are then taking our spirit and we're like an umbilical cord. If you allow me to use that word. We are taking our umbilical cord, spiritual umbilical cord, and we're connecting it to the demonic. To become one with. Very good. You know, a lot of people always say, man, Christians are just so, they're so stringent, they're so strict, they're so tough. Why? Because the Lord knows. He knows what will happen if we choose to align ourselves up. And so Satan knows that Christians are getting more mature and wiser and things are coming about. So he has to find other ways to do it. And once again, I'm not trying to be a dead horse. But even things that, that people are like, there's nothing wrong with it, Harry Potter. Yeah, there is. Why? It's conjuration, incantation, all of these kinds of things going on. Seeking wisdom, all these different things going on. And what do we do? We become intrigued with it. And when we become intrigued with it, we allow it into our life. If we allow that kind of occultic stuff into our house, into our body, inside of us, then basically what's going to happen is we connect and join ourselves to that. And I will tell you this much. Back in Texas, Pastor Keith and I were doing a deliverance on a girl who was 16 years old, and the mother was there because she's a minor. 16 years old. And she, yes, she had read every Harry Potter book. She had read it, saw every movie. She was so intrigued with it. She had to have, she had to look like the guy. She had to have all the clothes. She went all out. And then next thing you know, and I'm saying next thing you know, I'm talking about in a few months, the girl was being tormented. She had to sleep with her lights on. She she was she heard the voices. She heard the silhouette, saw the silhouette figures in her room. All of that. <clears throat> Things going on in her life that I can't even begin to tell you. And when we and when we uh, with the help of the Lord, when she worked through the the uh, the deliverance, I'm telling you, the manifestation of those demonic spirits that came out of that girl. I can't even begin to explain to you. I can't. And it was all because what? She connected her spirit to the demonic spirit. Okay? Alright. Let's move on. Can I make another statement here? One scripture that comes to mind as you're talking about that, you know, we don't want to be so far right or so far left that you don't don't believe us or anything. But the word of God says, my people will perish because of the lack of knowledge. And there's accountability here, us being pastors. We have to give you the knowledge of God that we know to teach you. And I believe by you learning this, God is setting us all up for such a time as this. I really do. I mean, just this week, Chris and I read an article yes. about this uh, pastor, a chaplain. yeah, chaplain speaking at, uh, in Washington D.C. It was spiritual warfare. He was breaking the curses over America. Yes, Christ. You can go to Elijah List for those of you that read Elijah List. It's an amazing website. It gets the word. It's the prophetic words. But on the ElijahList.com, he was the chaplain of the congressional uh, group. And this was just last week, I guess yeah. it was, the first week. And what he did was, he did, he broke the curses, spiritual warfare. He was, I mean, let me tell you, it was, he was, he was breaking the powers of the principalities. And this is in the, in the Congress. And this man was praying that. There's some significance there. I don't know about you, but ever since we even started, when the Lord told us you and I to do the spiritual warfare teaching, all of a sudden, I don't know about you, but do you start hearing it? You start reading about it? People are talking about it? You hear a pastor over here preaching about it? You see a, another um, article about it? And then when I saw that, we were like, oh my goodness. God is about ready to pour out his spirit, pour out his anointing, pour out his, his power, and he's breaking it what? From the top down. I need to tell you that prayer, that, that chapel was breaking the curses over our nation and the powers of the prince of 
announcing. Wow. I mean, if you do, if you go and elijahlist.com, it may be from last week, but you'll have a thing where you can go back and look at uh, articles in the past. All right. So hopefully we're going to try to get through some of this. If not, we'll take it up next week because I don't want to cut anything short. But we're going to talk about recognizing the curse, breaking the curse, reverse the curse, release the power of love, develop a godly attitude, align your words with God's words, Accept God's acceptance. Walk in obedience. Purpose of a generational curse. Price for generational curses has been paid. Amen. And triggering the effects of a generational curse. All right. Can I share something? What you just said. Uh, I want to share with you about the blue metallic forces. And that man that's sitting outside that said that the work was there, but they didn't have a platform to speak. So now is the season for that to come to pass. Yes. And God has been shifting and lining us up for the United States to get set free. Because when I had that dream, that's really what it was all about. It's about what he wanted to do, and he couldn't, because there were godly people there, but they didn't have a platform to speak for. Now they have it. The door's been open. Yes. And this is a season for our nation of great repentance. Yes. And there's a time that he's going to break forth. Because these um, prophetic words is going to come where there's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit for revival to come. He's been setting the stage for that to come, but it had to come from top to the bottom because the revival's got to flow out. And, and again, this, this aligns up with what we spoke in. Also, really quickly, just another side note, uh, there was another um, article I think I had posted on my Facebook page, but it was about um, President Trump's father, uh, who was a friend of Israel. He actually used his own money and purchased land in the Bronx and paid for a synagogue to be built, and he became very good friends with the rabbi. Uh, and this was all in, in President Trump's father, which I never knew. And I thought, wow, I did not know this. But that's FYI. I mean, there's a lot God is doing right now on this earth. I mean, it really is. I mean, a lot has to do with us in the United States. All right. Recognize the curse. In order to get set free and stay free, these are on your handouts. You have to admit you have a problem. That's the first thing. you got to admit it. You have to admit it. That sounds simple, but we live in a day and age of denial. No matter what has happened to us in our lives, each of us are responsible for the choices and decisions we make. If you really want to be free, you will accept that responsibility. And I mean, this is the thing too. Anybody that comes to us and he wants a deliverance, you know what we do? They have to ask. We don't go around saying, would you like that deliverance? Would you like that deliverance? Would you like that deliverance? <laughs> No, we don't. No, because it has to come from you. You have to make that choice. You have to make that decision. I need one. I want one. And that right there is the beginning of God being able to move and operate in your life because you're saying, God, I want you to help set me free from the bondages of the enemy, from the strongholds. Remember, you can't be demon-possessed if you're a Christian, but you can be what? Oppressed. Good. <laughs> All right. Break the curse. Let's just talk about this for a minute. As we apply God's word and power to our lives, as we choose to walk in righteousness and obedience to God, the chains of bondage will be broken. Not mine, but will be broken. There are three steps to bringing to breaking a generational curse. Number one, give your life to Jesus. The blood of Jesus removes our sin. You have to be a believer in order for a curse to be broken. Number two, fight the battle with spiritual weapons, such as the Word of God and the armor of God. You can't do it alone. What does the scripture say? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and the principalities and the rulers of this dark age. Okay? Casting down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Thought, if you are not going to be obedient to Christ, you have to leave him now. 
Here comes the thoughts the enemy throws at you. You will be obedient to Christ when you must leave now. Bring every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. All right, so we have, we all know, talking about the armor of God. I know many of us have a good understanding of that, about our weapons, the armor, the spiritual weapons. What are other weapons we could use in a sense in a case of spiritual warfare? What could we use? Praise. Praise. Prayer. What else? The word. The word. Worship and praise. Prayer. Having the armor of God. Using the name of Jesus. Pleading the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> speaking the word of God. Alright. Break. And then number three. Regain control over the power of your will. When Jesus shed his blood, he fought back our willpower. Through the blood of Jesus, we can say no to the temptations. And people are like, well, that's easier said than done. I know it's not easy. Jesus, with the help of his Holy Spirit, can give us the strength to say no. And the closer we walk with Jesus, the closer we stay in his word, the closer our relationship with Jesus is, you're going you're gonna to discern it a lot quicker. You're going to be able to take authority a lot quicker and, and deal with it right then and there and be on the offense instead of always having to be on the defense. If we stay close to the Lord, the enemy is going to think twice about backing you up. I mean, about attacking you. But he's going to attack you. If he attacked Jesus, he's going to attack you. But we have the weapons as Jesus had the weapons. He had the Word. He had the Holy Spirit. When, when we are being attacked by the enemy, and James it says to ask for wisdom, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't want to know seem to win, but ask the Lord for wisdom on how to fight this fight. Sure. And I, I cannot tell you the times in my life over and over, and my sleep will give me a word in my sleep. Because I'm fighting about a fasting prayer and reading. You know, I know to do it, and it just seems like I'm not getting anywhere. But when you ask the Lord for the wisdom, the wisdom is the wisdom that comes from God. It's the wisdom and affairs of this life and how to, how to live. How to walk, how to be a species of being, being in Christ, but you need that wisdom because you're going to confront the enemy and you don't always know how to say what to do. The enemy's always in someone else, by the way. So you have to, because our warfare is not flesh and blood, it's the spirit behind them, and you need to have that wisdom how to confront that. Wisdom is extremely important, and that's why over and over and over again, and God in His Word says to what? Ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom. Because we need that. When we're confronted with a situation or a battle before us, we do. But I will tell you one thing I also do is when I am going through a battle or a circumstance or situation in my life, you know, I do ask the Lord for His wisdom. Holy Spirit, tell me what I need to do. Tell me the strategies. Tell me what weapons are going to be effective here. Tell me whether or not this is a just a physical attack or is it a spiritual attack? Because sometimes when we get sick and we're just praying for healing, which is a very important thing to do, and you're not seeing results, ask the Lord because many times he said change your strategy. It's spiritual. It's coming from the enemy. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. And then when I change my strategy, then I've seen, you know, uh, some result. But any time I'm going through something, one of the things I ask the Lord is I say, Lord, what can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? What can I take from what I'm going through or what I just went through and make me stronger as a soldier in the army of the Lord for the next battle that's to come? How can I learn from this, Lord? What can you teach me? What can you show me? that would make me a better soldier. Okay? 
okay? Because we're soldiers. And the Lord is not going to send a believer, a follower of Jesus into the front lines of battle if he doesn't even know how to use the weapons. He's not going to stay in here. Go ahead. Uh, what you said up there, or the most oh, words, uh -huh. for no temptation and we can say no to every temptation. We've all been tempted every day, haven't we? The Word of God said no temptation can overcome you where I don't give you a way out. So if you don't know what to do, like James said, Cindy was saying that, you know, ask God for wisdom. If you don't know what to say, say, God, give me a way out from this temptation that's trying to overtake me. Give me a way out, Lord. We can all say that, can't we? Give me a way out, Lord. I can't handle this temptation that's upon me. Right. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where that's at, but it does say that. It is, you know, you'll not be tempted to or he will not make a way of an escape. He'll show you the strategies. He'll show you the weapons. He'll show you what you need to do. After all, Jesus is what? He's our commander-in-chief. Just like our military has a commander-in-chief, so do we. And his name is Jesus. Ask. He wants you to see the victory in your life and in that circumstance. He paid the price for you to have victory. Okay? And I know many of you have heard this before, but I feel like I have got to say it again for some of you who have not heard it. And that is what? The victory on what? Gaul Gotham. Gaul Gotham. Okay? In the four Gospels, three times it talks about Jesus on the cross at Gaul Gotham. There's only one that even mentions Calvary. Why is that? Because Gaul Gotham is the Hebrew word. And it means what? Place of the skull, right? Where Jesus, the cross came down on the place of the skull. On Golgotha. Alright? For those of you, bear with me. For those that you already know. But Jesus was crucified on Golgotha. When the cross came down, it came down into the ground. Golgotha, the place of the skull, is where David took the head of Goliath when he cut it off. Scripture says he took it to Jerusalem. And where they would have taken it is to Golgotha, which is called the place of the skull. So the head of Goliath was placed there. Hence the name Golgotha, Goliath of Gath, which is where he was from. He was from Gath. And so when the cross came down and went into the ground, in a sense, what happened and what symbolic is, is that Jesus crushed the head of the serpent, like it said in Genesis. It's going to happen. It's a place of Okay? Sandy so said a place of authority. It's a place of power. It's a place of victory. Because Golgotha, the head of the serpent, was here, and when the blood was spilled and was shed down, Jesus, and it went down and hit the ground, it hit what? The dust of the ground, and what was man made out of? The dust of the ground. The blood went and hit the ground, the dust of the ground, to cover mankind, but also to crush the head of the serpent, Goliath, the symbolic of the serpent, the enemy, and Jesus Christ. It. Why? So that you and I can have victory. Victory after victory after victory on the through the cross in our lives. And it's for what? Not only against sin, sickness, disease, the curses, the shame, the guilt, all of that, but victory over our enemy because Jesus crushed him. He crushed him. You've got to get that in your spirit. Jesus crushed the head of the enemy. Therefore, when Satan is coming at you, you give it all you got because you have the power of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the living God, the spirit of the sovereign Lord, the awesome almighty God is in you. The kingdom of God is in you. You are royalty. You are joint heirs with Jesus. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And you can just point your finger like the scripture says with the finger of God. I 
lives. Yes, we go through battles. Yes, sometimes we get knocked down. But my goodness, let's get back up. Let's get back up and continue walking forward with the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and the word of God. And continue to crush the head of a serpent who's trying to destroy your life or your children's life. Don't let him. He doesn't, Satan doesn't deserve it. And we give him too much credit. I don't even like to say, oh, Satan's beating me up. Oh, Satan's having a fair day with me today. Why do I want to give him glory? Right. Hey, I may be having a bad day, but I want to choose to say, oh, Jesus has got this. I got yes. his word. I got his blood. I got his name. Whatever is going on in my life, the victory is mine. I choose not to give glory to Satan. Half the time, he probably didn't even cause it. He's over here like, you want to give me glory? I'm like, all right. <laughs> and he doesn't deserve it. But Jesus does. Yes, amen. Jesus does, amen. Okay, we're going to have to take a break. We're going to have to take up next week and finish. What? What that proof that? Well, I said the word of authority is that when you lay up on the ground, and, and, and what you're just saying is true, but you're going to give us a great authority. When he killed out Satan, he took the Satan's power and gave it to us now an authority that we didn't have before, like we do now. That blood of Jesus means some authority. It means a power beyond this dimension in a world. That he said that the kingdom of God lives within you. It means I give you power and authority through that how God is means authority. Because it is that I can't. It is the power. We're going to finish up next week, but I do want to take you all the way back. I'm going to take you to the, to the what we always end with. Satan cannot read our thoughts, but he can hear our words. Showing me where Golgotha was, and he called it Golgotha. He said, Look, he, that's where Jesus was crucified. Mm -hmm. And you know, from the distance where we were, you know, you know, Chris said the skull of Goliath was buried underneath. Underneath Golgotha was this cave. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah, that gives me joy. It makes me see in the natural what the Holy Spirit is showing us in the supernatural right now. Everybody happy tonight? Yes. yes. We're fired up. <laughs> Play that rock in you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we take your word with authority. Yes. We know who we are in Christ. And Father, we know we have been equipped to do your battle. And Father, by the power and the authority of your word, we ask for a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our lives so we can go out that door and we can cast out demons, we can speak a, a word of love to someone. Yes. Yes. Whatever it is you want us to say, Holy Spirit, empower us with that ability to be able to discern what to say, what to do, and you're back in call. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.